Hello and welcome once again to The Change Exchange. My guest today, Brent Lindequy, has a company called Chaos Theory. So what is that about? It is not scientific. I don't <laughs> no, think. not at all. It's got nothing to do with science. Um, what it is, is a company that tries to bring the order to the chaos of events and brand activations. So we base ourselves in the event and activation space. Um, but it's been alive and kicking for the past seven years and has evolved to, to more of a creative space where we can conceptualize the events and brand activations and then bring them to life. How did you end up here? What did you want to be when you were a kid? Well, I was, every, every child's got dreams, right? Uh -huh. And when I was little, I wanted to be on stage or behind the cameras or on radio or something in the media space. But I don't think I ever really pursued it because of whatever the circumstances were. So rather, uh, parents, family, rather go and get a degree, rather go and study, um, work towards something where you are guaranteed a salary, although we're not in this country. Something to fall back on, my child. Correct, correct, yeah. exactly. <laughs> So, uh, what was your first job? My first job uh, during school, was I worked at Anandos. I, I was the guy behind the counter that took the orders. Um, and from there, I... What, what made you take that extra step? Because it's a choice. You have free time, you are 15 or whatever. You can either hang out with your mates or earn some money. I needed the money. So I think that's what it was. For, for, for what? For, for dreams or for shoes? For shoes, for oh, okay. clothes, for mm -hmm. um, going out to eat, for spending time on my social time. I needed the cash. And, um, and my pocket money just wasn't doing it. <laughs> so I, I realized quite quickly the value of money mm -hmm. and that I needed to start making my own. Um, Nando's didn't last very long because they didn't pay very well. So from that, I, I received, or I went and, and got a job at a, a wedding venue in the south of Johannesburg where I grew up in Alberton. And I worked there for many years, um, starting as a waiter into a full wedding planner. Um, I worked right next to the head wedding planner. So did you do that while you were studying still? During school and then while I was studying as well. Um, it was a fall back on uh, to make extra money. And in hospitality, the catering industry, weddings especially, there's good money. There's, there's people getting married every Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So the wedding venue was quite busy. And they're in the best of spirits. So they're generous, not Not always. Not you, really. get, you, get, you get bridezillas, which is not great um, to have them because it's quite stressful. And, and again, part of the learning curve, um, working in weddings, you're working with something which I now call emotional money. It's, it's somewhere where you've taken that money, you've saved the money, um, and you're spending it on yourself. A corporate budget, now I know, is a lot different. And the own company, when did that happen? So I moved on after studying. I, I applied for a position at a um, racing company as an event manager at Kalami Racetrack. And uh, we looked after, it was about 24 race cars, um, Formula 3 race cars that we used to take around the Kalami racetrack. And it was all corporate incentives. So Investec were bringing out 20 of their, their highest um, clients to come and drive on, on the racetrack. And from there, um, I think I realized that I didn't like taking orders. And I much appreciated doing my own thing. And I wanted to earn my own money and, and uh, keep my own profit and, um, and work towards owning my own company. So and the insecurity that comes with it uh, was you were willing to take that on as a balance, as, so a, as a quid pro quo. I think I, was, I think I was too young to understand insecurities <laughs> and risk at 23 or 24. Um, starting your own business, you don't know, you don't have a family, you don't have houses. I didn't have any of those um, obligations. obligations to pay for. So I took the risk and, and I, I decided that I wanted to have an event management company. Um, but event management companies in, in one cubic meter are a thousand. There's so many people that become event managers that I needed to do things a little bit different. So I started researching different products in, in the event space, things that weren't in the country, things that were a little bit different. Like um, one of the things we had was called Flogos. It was the craziest machine that we got from America, a big black box. And inside that box, it took foam and mixed it with helium. So it made the foam, but with helium, which made the foam rise. It got extruded through a negative stencil of a client's logo. And I literally created flying logos in the sky. Um, something that we brought in from America and, and the companies loved it. One of the, the biggest companies that jumped on board was Standard Bank. 
and we did their cricket series uh, for about three years that they had the Flogo machines inside the cricket stadiums um, just shooting up either sixes or wickets or the, the actual badge of standard back. So cool stuff. Get my foot in the door with products. Um, get clients to trust me. Create this, this atmosphere where they can trust my, my creativity and build my um, brand activation elements until I could do a full event, mm -hmm. which I was lucky enough to do. How does one get a client to trust you? I think delivering quality work. Mm -hmm. So um, I think business is pretty easy. Do what you say you're going to do. Um, and if you can do that, uh, sometimes maybe the unexpected that you add in where the quality is just really great. Your clients begin to trust you. Uh, and then start giving ideas. Um, why don't you try this? Why don't you add this in? This might work for your brand. And they, they begin to trust you. My clients have been with me for a really long time. And I think that's a, a, a great attribute for the company that mm -hmm. they stick around and they carry, continue to use me. Because events can be a bit of a, uh, oh, let's try someone new. It, so, it does. And I think there's almost a, a seven year cycle. <laughs> I think you stay with yeah. someone for about seven years and you work with them. And then mm -hmm. you might want fresh ideas and new blood and, and certainly um, new ideas to come to the forefront. But continuous, you still pick up new clients. So for mm -hmm. me, it's, it's also mm -hmm. that seven year trend where I get new clients coming in. Talk to me about networks about one person connecting you to the next one, connecting you to the next one. Because I think in business, that is, it's, it plays such a huge role. That's massive. And yeah. it's, it's the human connection. It's the I believe you because you used him. Mm -hmm. And by word of mouth is massive in our industry. Um, I don't believe that my website does me any justice for someone searching for an event company. You'd have to hear by word of mouth of what I've mm -hmm. done and then perhaps decide to use me in that regard. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is it now, about two years ago-ish, 2014, your life changed dramatically. How did that happen? Completely. So there was something going around the world globally that started in Australia called neck nominations. And the whole concept was quite stupid, actually. <laughs> um, it was to down as much alcohol as you possibly could, film it on camera, and then dare other people to do the same. If you look back at social media, it was most probably one of the first viral trends where people were using social media to try and create a viral trend. Um, it was going on globally, so it started in Australia, it was sweeping the world. There were hundreds of thousands of videos being uploaded of people doing the craziest things. Um, drinking goldfish, downing gin, and then nominating people to kind of do the same. I'd been watching it uh, trend on social media and there were a couple of things that were going through my mind. I think the first was if you ever do anything that has got alcohol in it and you dare people, it's bound to end badly. It's bound to end badly. The second um, is that I don't believe people understand that social media has consequences. I call social media at the moment a teenager because it's only like 15 years old. And teenagers are pretty rough if you look at it like that. Um, what we put on the internet now matters. And one day, if you're 18, drinking goldfish and dining gin, um, many years from now looking for a job, if they Google your name, that's what they're going to find. The third thing is that I live in South Africa. And in South Africa, we've got a huge portion of our population that live in poverty, mm. really bad poverty. Um, as South Africans, we, we tend to become a bit numb to it because we see so much of it. So... I had this thought that maybe if I did something a little bit different, um, even with just in my circle of friends, we'd be able to make a difference. If 10 people followed my suit, we'd be able to help 10 people, is what I was thinking. So I got Nick nominated, and on the, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Um, it was a Friday morning, and I decided to go to the store and get lunch for myself and a homeless person. I climbed into my car, I had my colleague next to me that was holding my camera phone, um, and I said to her, record this. Drove up to the intersection, winded down the window, mm -hmm. handed over a meal to a homeless person. Um, and even when I was posting the video, it was the first YouTube video I'd ever put up. Even when I was posting it, I felt quite stupid. <laughs> I thought to myself, am I doing something completely ridiculous, going against the grain of what everybody else was doing, the entire world? But you did end it with... And I dare so-and-so yes. to also do it. Yes, so I dared two people as well. Oh. I uploaded the video, and um, within about an hour, I had 301 views. I was blown away. I didn't even have 301 Facebook friends. So for <laughs> me, that was, that was quite big. Um, what I didn't know at the time is that when 
YouTube videos start going viral, they've got a panel of experts that are just making sure that it's nothing untoward. untoward. <laughs> um, and, and by that evening, I went to a friend's dinner and she took me aside and she just said to me, I'm so proud of you. And what you've done is really the true essence of what South Africa is. And I can't believe your videos had 10,000 views. And I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. Um, I had no idea that my life would change the way that it mm. did. Mm. Uh, the next morning, I had 100,000 views on the video. Um, there were international people phoning me, CNN, BBC. Um, I was featured on all sorts of newspapers around so the how world. So how did that make you feel? I mean, it, it must have been like a, a bit like a, being caught in a tsunami. You just went for a swim. That's the best way to explain <laughs> it. Um, it was the most overwhelming experience. And, and for me, I'd never been behind a camera or behind radio or ever in that space. Even mm. though I dreamed of it, mm. it was never part of my reality. Those, the next three or four weeks, I've actually got a diary where I wrote down every interview I went to. I took everything in so I could possibly remember it. Um, I hardly slept because my Facebook and my Twitter and my social media was going through the roof. I was receiving thousands of messages every day from people around the world that had just gone, this is so inspiring. Like, I need to take what you've done and do it. And I felt that I'm just a human being. My responsibility is to answer people and to, to respond to messages. So I was continuously responding to messages. Saying what? Um, do it. Go out there. Yeah. Take a video. Help someone. Don't do it on video. Just help someone. If, if I've caused this catalyst of change, go with it. Um, the only way that you can create action is by actioning something. So go do it. Um, bigger than that, there were hundreds and thousands of videos of people that had seen me that were doing that. Mm -hmm. So they were going around to their different parts of the world, be it Canada or France or the UK or even in South Africa, and they were just sharing kindness. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. So, uh, how did your life change? You acquired a radio show. So, yeah, <laughs> I, um, I fell in love with radio. I, the, first radio uh, the first radio show I was on, where I was in studio, was two days after that video. I was on 702 with John Robbie. And I remember it, I was so scared. I was, I was petrified. My hands were all clammy, and it felt like the interview went on for an hour. It Af was, it afraid was- Afraid of what? Um, that you would make a fool of yourself. I guess so. You, yeah. you, there's always those setbacks and you, and you fear the unknown, yeah, perhaps. It's always, Nervousness. The, always the thing we're most worried about. And um, you will fall flat on your face. Especially on radio. Like 702, it's quite a big breakfast show. A lot of people yeah. listen to it. Yeah. And, and it must have been 30 seconds that I was actually on air. I don't even think it was that long. But I realized very quickly that I really liked it. I really liked being on radio. I liked um, the platform that it would give me mm. to maybe make a bigger difference with with this other platform of my social media rising and people interested in me right now. It's our 15 minutes, right? So we need to try and do something good with it. Um, I contacted a friend who was a producer at Mix FM and I got onto Mix FM. I pitched to them to just do good news once a week to come in and share good news stories. Um, it was every Monday for about 20 minutes that I just, I would prepare and, and come up with a couple of good news stories about South Africa and the world. Um, and I, Why did you choose good news? Why was that your focus? I think a couple of reasons. The, the neck nomination had turned into a random acts of kindness. Yeah. So that sort of fits in the good news space. And South Africa needs it. South Africa desperately needs it. Our, our mainstream media, um, blood cells, isn't that what they say? Mm -hmm. and if it bleeds, it leads. That's it. And, and uh, the reality is the good news falls away. People, people forget that there's good things happening in South Africa. Mm -hmm. They forget about the, the Ubuntu and the good news and the, the really good news stories. So I thought if I can focus on that, it, it gives me a bit of a difference. So it's a niche. I might stand out. People might notice. Um, and also it will be delivering good news to South Africa, which is really what mattered to me. Um, during my time at Mix FM, Gareth had just left 5FM. And he would just started um, Clip Central. Mm -hmm. For me, that is a maverick in his time, and he's really got foresight into what the future is. So I decided with my little experience on Mix FM, I would contact him, um, and I would pitch him a good news show, a full hour of just bringing people good news. Uh, I sat down with him on the Thursday, and he offered me the job on the Friday. <laughs> and I started working the following week, Tuesday, so it was quite quick. Yeah. Um, Cliff Central, the good stuff, has been going for about two and a half years now. And we're always in the top 10 of the, good, of the shows out of the 38 shows that are there. Um, and I can still say it's not because of me. It's got nothing to do with me. 
it's because the country really needs good news and they enjoy it. Because of the content. Totally. Yeah, yeah. totally. And the experience of sitting in front of a, of a microphone and communicating with people out there? So I, I still sometimes go and listen to my first shows that I ever did and I'm embarrassed um, because I, I, I didn't have an idea of what I was doing <laughs> and I was, I was simply just there with a passion to share yeah. good news. And, so and what did you do wrong? It. Uh, the questions I was asking during the interview were ridiculous. Um, I've, I've subsequently learned that uh, as a radio host or as a talk show host, it's my job to make um, the person that I'm interviewing really comfortable mm -hmm. and for them to be in studio and to open up to me and, and, and really for it to be conversational. Yes. Um, and I think for the first year, I had a list of 10 questions that I asked every single person exactly the same. <laughs> Just um, tick the box. Did I do it? Is it right? Uh, how are you? Where do they find you? And, and I guess it's all learning, right? Um, after every show, I would listen to my show and I'd try to be better. And, and two and a half years down the line, I still do it. I still listen to the shows. I still try to be better. I want to be the best in the field that I possibly can be. That is really brave to listen to yourself all the time. I think you have to. I think you have to. You, uh, I, want to be, I want to be better. And, and the only way to be better is to know where my weaknesses lie. And... Um, that's the only way to do it, is to listen to your own voice, <laughs> which is not great either. I don't enjoy it. <laughs> Brent, just one um, a bit left field question. It just feels, I didn't know the, the, the whole history, but it just feels completely weird. If I had to ask you to hold a camera to film me while I'm doing something good, feels a bit So it is, and, and it might come off as a bit contrived, and you're like filming yourself doing yes. a good deed, yes. and look at that privileged oak handing out something. It's not a random act of kindness if someone is set up to, to film, film it. it. Correct. <laughs> but, but the way that I saw it, and the way that I, that I tried to portray it to everybody, is I wasn't doing it for gratification. Mm. I was doing it to inspire others, and I was trying to use... The and that happened. I was trying to use the social media platform to really just inspire others to go out and do good. Mm. Um, a lot of the world, not just South Africa, people are inherently good and they want to do good, but they don't have the platform to do it. And sometimes they just need that little push mm. to remind them that it is this easy. It is that easy to, to do good. One of, um, so last year on Mandela Day, uh, totally left field. The last year on Mandela Day, um, I got given cupcakes, like a million cupcakes to give away. Go and give them away to whoever you can. And I stopped at an intersection where there was a homeless lady begging. And I tried to hand her the cupcake through the window and the light went green. And the woman behind me started hooting and she was going crazy. And I got out the car and I, I was sort of like, I'm just giving over food. And she went, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't realize that mm. you were doing something human. Mm. And I gave her the cupcake and I got into my car and I drove away and it bothered me a little bit because mm. I thought I was, I was trying to do something good and she didn't realize that. Mm. But afterwards, it's almost like she did. So I wrote a Facebook post about it. And I said, this angry woman in Audi is what I called her. And the Facebook post traveled a little bit and people shared and liked and did whatever they did. And she responded to the Facebook post. So somehow, we're all from Johannesburg, it was connected. And she apologized and she said, I never knew that you were doing what you were doing but you have inspired me now to, to continue helping this woman that she sees every day that's been there. Mm. So I think that is it. People need um, a push to just be a little mm. bit kinder and a reminder, maybe, that they can be. That it is actually easy. It is easy. Yeah. It is easy. Uh, For some of us, I mean, uh, as you say, there are such huge divisions in South Africa. Totally, yeah. totally. A lot, of, a lot of the myth around um, the homeless in South Africa and the, the beggars on the side of the road is that they want to be there and that it's easy to be there and that um, they if they got given a job, then they would leave the job to rather be. And if you give them money, they'll drink it up anyway. So, so here's what I say to that. Um, if you can go stand on the side of the road seven days a week from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and it's easy, go for it. Go for it. And, and if a homeless person is using my money to buy alcohol to get through the night yes. to face the next day, go for it as well. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's facing their own demons and they, they're in this life on their journey. Um, it's up to us to help each other. Mm -hmm. Plans and dreams, career-wise? Career-wise, um, I want to build the Good News platform. It's, it, it's become a passion project of mine and I'm lucky enough to have a business to be able to fund me Mm. Um, I don't get paid for being on radio. I do it completely out of uh, the passion of sharing good news and knowing that 
I'll just inspire one person today. All I need is one person to respond <laughs> or one person to go, hey, that's a cool story yes. and it makes me feel a bit better. A year ago, um, I realized that these stories needed to be shared a little bit more. So I was doing all the research for my shows and I was finding so many good news stories in South Africa that no, nobody was publishing. So I started a Facebook page because social media, that's where we live. And, and the, one of the first stories that I shared got two and a half million reaches and it like went out into the social media universe. Absolutely phenomenal. So I decided to open up a website called goodthingsguy.com. I swear I only had one reader when I started because it was so new. Um, and now we, I'm, I'm, I'm researching and sharing up to six or seven good news stories a day, from mostly from South Africa, because um, I feel that South Africa really needs it. And I have a, a readership last month, we celebrated over 950,000 readers that have come to the website. So my idea and my hope and my dream is to build that. I'd love to be uh, the good news 24. I'd love to be the, that side and that big and that great that people tune into it when they want to be informed, but informed on good news of the happenings in South Africa. And uh, your personal life, you say in your description of yourself somewhere, I am involved. Involved with another person? Involved with another person. <laughs> I'm engaged. I have oh. an incredible fiancé. He is just absolutely phenomenal. We've been together for eight years. Um, supports me and, and in all my craziness, whenever I come up with these ideas that I want to start a website or I want to go do this or he's just, he's there. He's, he's always supporting me and, and being my biggest sort of cheerleader. And what was the, the first thing that made you think, hmm, this is more than just a, a little fling? It was our first date, actually. It was the first time that I'd, that I'd ever met him and mm. we went out on a date and I knew. I was, I just, it's something inside you ticks, um, and I knew that he would be the one. And it's eight years later. And it's eight years later, and it still feels like day one. So <laughs> that, that's good news. And tell me about your home. Where do you live? We live in Danefern, um, mm -hmm. in, in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg. Uh, very lucky with the house we found. It took us a long time to, to uh, it's almost a year of searching for houses. And um, Why? What made the difference? What did you want? What were you looking for? I think my buyer's decision process has got 27 steps. <laughs> so especially when it's a big spend, it takes a lot to sort of go, this is it. Yeah. This is a commitment for the next 20 years yeah. or whatever it is. Um, and the, the house that we found, it, I think it just spoke to me. It was my sort of style. It, um, it my space. It's very open plan, uh, very earthy. And it's just, it really did speak to me. And again, he's, he's quite the clever one because I fell in love immediately and the estate agent was there. And I was like, I love it. We're going to buy it. It's amazing. And he was going, mm, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't yeah, think it's great. Yeah. I don't think the price is, is not it. quite right. Yeah, it's not exactly what we wanted. And I still pulled out the driveway. We were in separate cars and I phoned him and I said to him, no, this cannot be. We, like, we, we are so good on all decisions. Yes. This cannot be. And he went, Brent, you have to pay hardball. We yes. want to get the price down. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're a good team, and uh, we found the perfect place. And is there one thing, what do you do first? Or do you, is there a picture you hang up? Is there a, a bookshelf you install? So you there's, a guitar you, you take? There's something that's traveled with me since varsity. In, in university, I got a diary given to me. Um, I can't even remember. It must have been like 2004. And the diary had... It was a Picasso-themed diary. So every couple of pages, it had a, something of Picasso, some sort of artwork. And I know nothing about art. I'm, I'm quite scary. Like, I couldn't tell you anything about art. But I, I kept some of those pictures. I then went and had, um, I, I took them to an art person, and mm. a printer, and they printed 16 different blocks oh. for me. And that goes with me from wherever I live. It sort of travels with me. It's a beautiful, it, it's almost like a, a storytelling wall now because it's these 16 canvases of Picasso that all travel with me. May you be, live there for a long time and be very happy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for the visit. Thank you. It's been incredible. Until next time, go well. <laughs>